Soviet Republic, the Ukraine, says it's taking control of all the military equipment on its territory and setting up its own armed forces. The weaponry includes nuclear missiles, but a spokesman for the Ukrainian parliament said the Republic would share control of these with Moscow. The Ukrainians are determined to set up their own armed forces and the numbers they're talking about are considerable. There would be 420,000 troops in their army, air force and navy and another 30,000 in their national guard, almost half a million men in all. Just as significant perhaps is their desire to take control of Soviet military equipment on Ukrainian territory, like these long-range nuclear bombers and like some of the navy's Black Sea fleet. There is now confusion, though, about exactly what will happen to nuclear weapons in the Ukraine. Its defense minister, Konstantin Morozov, claims he has jurisdiction over all military units in the republic. But a spokesman for the parliament there has said there's no need to panic, that nuclear weapons are not being nationalized, that they will stay under a joint Soviet command. What's clear is that the Ukrainians want less and less to do with Moscow and Mr. Gorbachev. First, they refused to sign his economic treaty, binding the republics together. Then they boycotted the new parliament here, and now they're setting up their own army in open defiance of the Soviet president. Only two days ago, Mr. Gorbachev said it would be irresponsible and illegal for any republic to form its own army. He threatened to take measures to stop it happening. Ukrainians, though, are not easily intimidated. <laughs> Everyone knows how little authority presidential decrees have here. Gorbachev is like a child threatening his father. He just doesn't have the power to carry out his threats. It may be that the increasingly nationalist Ukrainians are now seeking outright independence. Or it may turn out that they're simply flexing their muscles in an attempt to win as many concessions as they can for when they do eventually join a new confederation of Soviet republics. Ben Brown, BBC News, Moscow. The Dutch government, which holds the European Community Presidency, is tonight. For this week's assignment, John Tuser, Managing Director of BBC World Service, assesses what response the West should make to the new nationalism sweeping Eastern Europe in a debate with those who think it truly democratic and those who believe it revives old hatreds. Good evening. Tonight's assignment debates the rebirth of nationalism as a potent force in European politics. As war rages in Yugoslavia, we're reminded that the continent is plagued by ancient rivalries and suspicions. To debate the issues, assignment has brought together a distinguished panel of speakers. Galina Starovoitova is one of the advisors to Boris Yeltsin. Sir Ralph Darendorf is warden of St. Anthony's College, Oxford. Jan Czarnogórski is the Slovak Prime Minister. Dr. Gareth Fitzgerald was a former Irish Prime Minister. Hans-Peter Ferrer is the political director of the Council of Europe. Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., a leading American academic who's advised American presidents. Slava Stetsko is president of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. Enoch Powell left the Conservative Party to protect British independence. And Branko Saleh, the Croat Minister of Information, has just arrived from besieged Zagreb. Well, should we be worried about the re-emergence of nationalism, or is it simply an inevitable part of the transition to a new democracy? Is the dream of a new and united Europe threatened by the growing anarchy and the turmoil in the East? Can the proliferation of new nations do anything to quell old hatreds? Europe is in the middle of its greatest transformation since 1918. The euphoria unleashed two years ago by the people's revolutions rekindled long repressed feelings of national identity. The breaching of the Berlin Wall in 1989 brought about the collapse of political systems which had stifled the aspirations of a generation. But it also unleashed ethnic tensions which had bedeviled Europe for centuries. 
Intense national rivalries led to the outbreak of the continent's bloodiest war in 1914. In 1918, the American president, Woodrow Wilson, tried to bring stability to the Europe of warring peoples by establishing new rules for national self-determination. Rights for national minorities were enshrined in the Treaty of Versailles. Continuing disputes over national boundaries contributed to the events which led finally to war in 1939. The 1945 pact made between the Allies at Yalta again tried to set new rules to secure the peace. The agreement imposed the political division which froze the map of Europe for nearly 50 years. Today, the ugly face of nationalism seems to be revealing itself. Less than two years after the momentous events of 1989, greater democracy seems to be leading to greater intolerance. Former communist states are disintegrating and old ethnic disputes are resurfacing. Breaking up seems to be the thing to do. In Yugoslavia, ethnic rivalries have sparked off a civil war and across Europe, people are bracing themselves for more ethnic unrest. How long, one asks, before this open hostility spreads westwards. As Europe's ethnic cauldron begins to simmer again, can the lid be kept on? I, th I think we should attempt to try to define what the nature of these new nationalisms and ethnic movements are. And that's why I want to start with Mr. Saleh from Croatia. What, how do you define the nationalist impulse driving the Croats on? Well, what we have to do with is uh, a nation, very old one, which has not had the possibility of expressing its own identity in a democratic way, not until last year, uh, uh, March, April last year to be specific. As a result of elections, people felt for the first time in 45 years that they had the government that they chose themselves. And um, it was said to be a uh, nationalist government. Uh, in my mind, it was just a government which tried to be fair and tried to do, uh, to be equal with all its citizens. Uh, the constitution that has been adopted afterwards really bears, uh, bears mark of that. And I would take exception to the description of the of the fight that goes on there is ethnic strife between Croats and Serbs in the first place. I think what we have is something else. There is aggression of Croatian territory from other side, from the Republic of Serbia and Yugoslav army. I, I think I should say at this stage, the reason we have a, a Croat and not a Serb is that we are attempting to avoid the minutiae of uh, these uh, great, great issues. Um, and um, that therefore we haven't paired off the uh, ethnic groups one, one by one. But Madame Stetsko, what do you think that the nature of the national or ethnic impulse is that is moving Europe now? Uh, I think that nationalism is a very powerful force because nationalism is in reality now liberation nationalism which would like to restore the independence for the nation which was deprived of this independence and uh, in my mind uh, according to our uh, Congress's nationalism is very democratic one. And uh, I don't think that uh, nationalism is to be, part, to be parted from democracy because in my mind, our Ukrainian nationalism is very democratic one. What we want, we want to have uh, a people to be ruled them by themselves on their own territory according to law, to the constitution, which uh, is uh, as a result of uh, our own spirit based on our tradition, on our uh, uh, culture, and uh, to accept also the, all the best uh, uh, examples of the Western democracy. Can, can I just check you there, because you're making some important and large claims, which I'd like to test against those who are not, as it were, in the middle of this, <coughs> uh, these ethnic and national, uh, national problems. Sir Ralph, how do you react to these definitions of what the nature of the present uh, turmoil is? I think it's very important that we get our language right. Independence for new countries in Europe is probably a necessary condition of development in a number of parts of Europe. But independence is not the same as liberty. And I'm actually rather worried about the emergence of 
tribal states, of states which aim at a homogeneous population. I'm, I happen to be quite fond of what I call the heterogeneous nation state, the nation state which combines uh, different groups, culturally, religiously, um, ethnically, racially, on the basis of common citizenship rights. And what I observe in um, East Central Europe and in Southeastern Europe is that there's quite often a confusion of the desire for independence with a desire to be among one's own, which very quickly leads to intolerance within and hostility without. Gareth Fitzgerald? Well, that's particularly true in areas where there are minorities mixed up together. And Southeastern Europe, in particular, uh, is an area where that is true. Uh, in almost every country, there are minorities of people from another country left there by historical forces. And in those circumstances, human rights has to be uh, determined in terms of minority rights. And I'm not sure that we haven't got a structure to protect minority rights. We should have had that by now, and we haven't. And new states coming into being without that kind of international structure and acceptance of the need to protect minority rights does create problems. I think we'll come on to the structures a little bit later. Can I just hear from uh, Jan Czarnogorski how you define the nature of the Slovak uh, wish for independence or, or autonomy? What is the nature of the Slovak nationalistic impulse? I, can see, uh, I consider the national idea <clears throat> as a positive one because this idea is, uh, creates a base for mutual solidarity, for a feeling of uh, sec security among people, uh, and uh, this idea could be developed. Don't Should you have security within Czechoslovakia? Within, uh, first with, within nation. First, first within nation. Of course, the national idea covers a great danger that uh, that it could lead to uh, to animosity between uh, to, uh, towards another nations so the uh, development of national uh, national idea should lead to uh, dividing the the positive aspects of the national idea uh, from negative aspects of national idea and to suppress the negative aspects and to develop the positive aspects. But, but, but uh, this is all very well. I think that um, it would take an enormous optimist to think that what we were witnessing was the um, uh, positive aspects of, of nationalism. What everybody is aware of is the, the negative aspects. Can I hear first from Galina Starovoitova how you balance up the, the, the positive from the negative aspects of nationalism? Hmm. Uh, I am a representative of the very ancient and at the same time very young Russian state. Uh, Russian and Soviet empire now uh, is, is losing all uh, its former colonies. Despite that, I can say that we cannot estimate uh, the nationalism only as a negative phenomena. I think nationalism is a good base a uh, good base for the civil society. And nationalism very often in the post-communist uh, states are the form of protest against the immoral um, state policies. That is why I think it is very natural phenomena. Um, and despite we all are the witnesses of the very bitter experience in Yugoslavia, uh, I am an optimist, and I think uh, the civil society cannot be built without a national factor. Arthur Schlesinger, will you uh, endorse that historically, that the sense in which this new ethnicity and nationalism is a reaction to communist totalitarianism, that this is one of the positive sides of the present phenomenon? Well, as an American, I naturally sympathize with people struggling for independence. But as a historian, one must regard, it seems to me, the fragmentation, the balkanization of Europe with concern. After all, the two great world wars which shadowed this century uh, were precipitated precisely by ethnic rivalries, one in Serbia, the second in Sudetenland and Danzig. I don't think that the multiplication of states is necessarily the solution to the problem of a fair treatment of minorities. And I think what we must concentrate upon is how to get peoples of diverse ethnic, religious, racial origins to get, live together in harmony, and how to provide constitutional protection uh, for minorities which feel themselves threatened or oppressed. Mm. And I think the, that is a, the answer lies in that direction, rather than in the, in the multiplication of states and borders, because every minority contains its own minority and the, the logic of that leads to international energy. Enoch Powell, how do, how do you see this? I liked what the Ukrainian lady said 
I think she was very near to the central truth that if you want democracy, you've got to have nations. I say this is a self-evident proposition because in a democracy, you accept a majority decision. Now, you only accept a majority decision if you identify yourself in some sense with the rest of those who have either, <coughs> either elected the representatives or taken that decision by some electoral process. You can only do that if there is a people or a nation. And a nation or a people are those who are prepared to accept an internal decision taken by majority. Mm. But isn't the problem that you have got significant minorities who are denying exactly this sort of consent because they don't believe that there is a state entity to which they can subscribe? Well, in all nations there are dissentients. But overall, a nation is that within which the population accepts majority decision taken through the institutions of that state. And the reason why all this has come upon us with the breakup of communism is because communism has unleashed the desire for self-government. And for self-government, there has to be an identified self which separates and distinguishes itself from other selves. It has to know itself. So are these movements... Uh, Can off? I just say a word about this? I mean, the, I see what Mr. Powell is getting at. But you see, this is just not the way people are living in this Europe. That is, if you look at Europe, people are living all over the place. I've just read a long article about the new law of nationality in Latvia. Now, this law defines Latvian nationality and citizenship in such a way that over 40% of those who are presently in Latvia cannot conceivably become citizens. Now, that's the way we live in this Europe. And so we have to find ways of establishing citizenship rights for all, independent of um, the strong sense of belonging which people may have in linguistic, religious, ethnic or other groups. But that is saying that we have to find a solution to the problem of democracy, even where there does not exist the substratum of consent. I think that uh, uh, today is very difficult to speak uh, uh, of a nation or of a state without national minorities. Uh, and if these national minorities are, are not uh, danger in the Western Europe, why should be there in Eastern Europe? Because well, uh, they happen to be fighting one another in, in Eastern Europe oh, at the present time. Uh, and excuse there are me, in Ukraine we have, a big, uh, we have many <coughs> national minorities, but uh, uh, there is no, thanks God, interfront. Our leaders of our parties know uh, how to secure these national minorities, and they are... Uh, uh, participating in the parties, uh, in all organizations, <coughs> and uh, we, a priori, we are guaranteeing them the same equal rights as Ukrainians, for Poles, uh, Russians, uh, Jews, uh, Bulgarians, and all others. And I would like just to uh, remember that uh, Latvia, with such a huge uh, minority, they, it, it has uh, the, when it, it came to voting for national independence, these national minorities were for mm -hmm. Latvian independence because they knew they would have better in Latvia, even if they are minority, than they would have, for instance, in the Soviet Union. But what Sir Ralph was saying was that the definition of Latvian statehood then itself begins to create new problems. I wonder what Madame Starovoitova thinks about the position of Russians within the Ukraine. Are you satisfied that Russians, a sizable minority, will, will get a fair deal in an independent Ukraine? Uh, first of all, I can say about the Latvian experience. Uh, we, I mean Russian Democrats, willingly uh, refused from the role of the big brothers, brother. And um, we supported the willing for full independence uh, of Baltic countries. We supported them. We congrat congratulated them after independence uh, after was announced. But now we are a little bit disappointed because, as Sir Derendorf said, uh, in fact, now um, uh, there is a danger uh, that a Russian sizable minority, in Latvia it is 48% Russian-speaking people, uh, they will de deprive the civil uh, rights. And now um, I hope the uh, Ukrainian will not, um, will not uh, repress uh, over, uh, all the ethnic minorities, I'm sure, but uh, at the same time, being uh, advisor of the Russian president, I receive every day 
the letters and the telegrams from Crimea, for example, from the eastern part of the Ukrainian uh, and the Russian people uh, are not support the idea of uh, Ukrainian independence. It is not the c question of the uh, repression of their human rights. It is um, the problem of their social psychological adaptation. They found themselves uh, living abroad to be an emigrant. It is so unexpectedly for May them. I I'm, to I'm, that? I'm, I'm going, going to, <laughs> I'm going to sit say on you for a moment. To that? I'm, uh, just for a moment, because otherwise we shall have a Ukrainian-Russian uh, debate, <laughs> which I want to hold just for a moment. <laughs> Enoch Powell is looking particularly, particularly gnomic. I mean, what do you feel about this exchange? One can only discover by experiment what is or is not a nation which will support a democracy. Do you think the Ukrainians will support a democracy? And we only know when we tried the experiment whether the population of Latvia will support a self-governing democratic Latvia. But that can't be determined by statistics. It can't sure. be determined by examination of ethnic origin or of language. Otherwise, there'd be no United Kingdom. Arthur Schlesinger? I think you have to distinguish between political minorities and ethnic minorities. I think in any nation which is based upon the idea of separate ethnic communities it re re invites a kind of tri uh, tribal warfare. The secret of the success of such as it has been of the U.S. as a multinational society has been the process of assimilation, the creation of a new national identity. I think where, where the idea is to promote and cherish separate communities, you would have a different problem and the one which is not so susceptible to democratic solutions. Mm. I think, as I say, every, take the Slovakia, Slovakia, 12% of the population of Slovakia is Hungarian. What happens to the Hungarians in, in, in Slovakia if they're an independent Slovak state? So the Slovak Prime Minister is in the position to tell us. Yes, uh, in Slovakia there are three political parties of Hungarians in, in Slovak parliament. One of them is member of the government coalition. One of my deputies is Hungarian. Uh, so uh, they practically they can decide themselves uh, the, the arrangement and gov practical government in, in the areas where they live. And in local, uh, local elections last year, November last year, in uh, towns and villages where they are at least half, they have practically won the local elections and uh, have the majority in the local assemblies. And at what stage, what happens when they start to ask for union with Hungary? Uh, it would be complicated because it's not a clear Hungarian uh, uh, territory inhabited by Hungarians. It's a, it, it is a mixed territory of Slovaks and Hungarians. But that is the problem, and that is the problem in Croatia, Mr. Saleh, as well, isn't it? That you have large Serbian uh, enclaves, but I imagine that it's never absolutely clear cut. Then we're there in the process of discovering what elements in the former Yugoslavia can be self governed. But it's a pretty expensive and bloody form of discovery, well, it isn't is. it? And that's how things are. Yes, but you see, I, I, I feel I have to, 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 to go back on something Sir Ralph said, which I think proved my mm -hmm. point. Uh, Croats and Croatian government and cr new Croatian regime is really not in the conflict with national minorities, as it were. I spoke to a Slo Slovak uh, premier before this program, and uh, he told me there are five or 6,000 uh, Slovak children in, in Slovakia at the moment which have fled from the areas where they fight. They haven't fled from Croatian government. They fled from that aggressor army that is attacking uh, the territory of Croatia and Slovaks and Hungarians as well. Yes, but you'd still be faced with the problem of how you give decent minority representation to Serbs if the problem is addressed in ethnic terms. Yes, and they have, they have had a very good uh, representation in the parliament. The problem is that they didn't want to take part. The parts, but, they, well, look, <laughs> sorry, is, is, isn't that exactly the point? You say they have decent representation and they say, thank you very much, we don't want to be part of this show. Yes, well, what, where do you arrive at then? At a, you have to stand by one principle, and that is there is some kind of historical con uh, continuation of uh, certain nations. They've lived on a certain territory and they uh, believe that that is their homeland, so to say. Well, some of them do. I wonder what Ralph Darendorf thinks about that. Um, 
Well, I, I mean, I, I really think we've got to the heart of the issue. And in, my, in my view, Mr. Powell is raising a profound and important question, but he's giving a totally unacceptable answer to it. And the profound question is, how can you make sure that democratic institutions are anchored somewhere, and they can only be anchored, he says, if there is a population in which they command uh, more than just formal respect. But he then says, in order to get that situation, people have to sort themselves out, as it were, through war, in these bloody experiments, in which they throw out minorities. And I say, on the contrary, what we have to try and do is establish civil society and a sense of civil rights for people who are diverse and see whether there aren't ways, as there were for quite a long time and perhaps still are in the United States of America, of getting diverse people to accept common, not just values, but rights, essential rights, a floor on which everybody stands. And this, of course, is the great worry about, um, about a process which I can well understand and even appreciate. Gareth Fitzgerald. I, of course, accept that, but <clears throat> I don't think that we can determine what states will come into being. The process of new states coming into being is happening, and I, I take Arthur Tessinger's point, but it, it might be said to be better if they, if they weren't. That's a, a, an outside view, but if you're in the place, they, they are coming into being, and we have to help them towards a, a peaceful adjustment and towards acceptance of and proper treatment of minorities. And here I think the European community's role is potentially important, because the community replacing, uh, the, the old empires failed, the Russian empire, with the, Multi twice, it failed twice, in fact, the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and even the United Kingdom didn't work entirely when Ireland was in. Whether it will work entirely with what's left, I don't know. But the European community, built up, building up from the bottom upwards, has acceptance not merely by the nation states in it, but also by the nationalities in the states which are contesting the states and which seek a certain role for themselves. And it, it, it has shown this capacity, and the countries of Eastern Europe look to the community and to its example and to the zone of peace that's established. And I think that its role and responsibility is great, but can only be exercised effectively if it itself becomes more coherent than it is now. I want to go back to that question in a moment. Having uh, rather rudely um, um, cut off uh, Madame Shtatsko when she was going to reply to <coughs> Galina Stadovoitova, you, uh, sorry, Ukraine, and this is what Gareth Fitzgerald said, Ukraine is presumably an emerging nation. Now, what are the problems of this new emerging nation? It's not an em emerging nation. Ukraine was independent states uh, a thousand years ago, and Ukraine Christianity accepted also a thousand years ago. Ukraine is an old nation and at the same time new nation because it was for so many years under Russian occupation uh, and, uh, and later on under communist uh, occupation. And I think uh, we should uh, have uh, equal uh, principles and defend them for all nations in the world. The, the principle is self-determination of nations. But so Ukraine exploited this principle and declared its independence on the 24th uh, of September. Ukraine parliament declared independence. But what about the Russian minority, which Madam uh, Starovoy was? Already, I already said that Ukraine uh, uh, has, uh, is going to accept a new constitution and already now all the Ukrainian parties in their program are guaranteeing the rights for national can minorities. I, can I a brief reply from uh, Mr. Uh, uh, as to whether uh, those are the, sort of, yes, yes. the, sort of, no, the sort of reassurances which are likely to reassure the Russian minority? Uh, I cannot uh, blame now the Ukrainian state or another state. Uh, I, uh, can, um, I can understand that Russian can be blamed much more maybe. But now I can um, uh, stress only one point. Uh, if the Ukraine uh, uh, recognizes the right for self-determination for itself, and uh, um, we recognize it, of course, I hope the Ukrainian can recognize the same right for another people's, for example, for the population of Crimea. You know that Crimea Peninsula okay. was just gifted, just uh, presented in Khrushchev time from Russia to Ukraine, to the Ukraine without the proper documents, without any referendum and so on. I think what this is demonstrating in a very graphic way, excuse Crimea. me, what this demonstrates in a very graphic way is that once you start down any one of these disputes, you are down a very long, <coughs> no. tortuous historical uh, um, debate. One which we really, point we, is well, there. We, we, may, I, may I pass on because we do have other things to discuss. Arthur Sessinger briefly and then I want to bring in uh, Mr. Ferrer. I think every ethnic majority is going to issue reassurances to the minorities. Yeah. The great question is how do you make sure these reassurances are carried out? I think it's a challenge really to Europe 
to develop some kind of institution to which minorities who feel themselves oppressed can make some kind of appeal, some minority right court equivalent to the court of human rights. I think that is really what we ought to be thinking about, how if minorities feel themselves oppressed, they can have some appeal to some higher authority. It's wonderful how everything comes back to Europe when there's a tight corner. Hans-Peter Ferrer, what, what are the opportunities? And can Europe actually deliver, any of the European institutions deliver in this matter? Uh, I am working uh, for a European institution, not the community, but the Council of Europe, which has been created in '49 to overcome nationalism in Europe, out of a feeling of never again after the Second World War. We cannot say that we managed to succeed everywhere in Western Europe up to now. There are still some problems. But at least we have got the recipe. And the recipe is the common commitment of the countries who participate in it to three basic principles. Pluralist parliamentary democracy for everybody, with fair participation by everybody. The respect of human rights, not only nationally, but internationally with collective guarantees for the good behavior of the states. That's what we have in Strasbourg with the human rights bodies which have been referred to the court in particular. And the third principle is the rule of law. That means, means also that if there is a problem, you cannot just uh, try to uh, solve it by the force. Mm. You must go by procedures, by rules, and to start with, you must speak with the people. And everybody must have a right to speak out and to, to say what its co his concerns are. I imagine there's nobody who disagree with, or is there, who oh, disagree with those principles. No. But you so, have to be the sort Mr. of people who will put up, put up with, by, with these matters being decided over their heads. And in, in order to find that sort of people, you've got to find a nation. It is an argument in a circle. A nation is the people who can be democratically governed. Even the United States had to fight a war to prove that it was a nation. It, it had to destroy state rights in order to create a nation. So are you saying that the principles which uh, Mr. Ferrer has uh, outlined cannot apply when a state such as Yugoslavia, uh, whatever its shortcomings, is, is well, falling apart? Well, what I'm apart? saying is that we don't have them in the United Kingdom because we're not that sort of a state. We're the sort of state where parliamentary government is accepted and where the rule of a majority guarantees what can be distilled by others as human rights and the rule of law, what they will put up with. And Mr. Ferrer? And I said, and I insisted on that, uh, that it is not just majority rule which mm. should be allowed to decide everything. It is fair participation by everybody in yes. the democratic process. And that is very important. You see, the Council of Europe is now the organization which is opening up to the new democracies in Eastern and Central Europe. It's the first framework in which they can be involved uh, in European cooperation. And this, we must seek to it that this happens with a clear commitment to the principles. I am convinced if the Europeans had had a more clear message during this spring and this summer towards Yugoslavia, not to talk just about unity and maintaining unity of Yugoslavia, but to tell them what is needed now is to implement the principles of democracy, human rights and the rule of law in Serbia too, and all over Serbia, mm. including Kosovo and Vojvodina. Do you accept we that, would have been off? I totally accept it, accepted, and it's actually the reason why I believe that in this particular situation, and certainly with respect to the issues we're talking about, the Council of Europe is more important than the European community is the one organization which is trying to persuade uh, members to adopt the rules which um, it has, I think, laid down in an exemplary fashion, yes? See, uh, Mr. Czarnogorski. Uh, I agree with, with the principles and, and I think that already existing European institutions could help uh, put uh, these principles into, into force if they would give to new emerging nations a clear perspective. Okay, you could be uh, uh, accepted maybe later in, in a few years if you accept these principles in your inner order. Yes, I think if, if, if recognition of new states when it come, comes up as an issue were dealt with on the basis they'll be recognized if they operate a system respecting human rights and minority rights, and that's a clear condition they 
very keen to get recognition, would perhaps uh, be constrained in some of the actions that might otherwise be taken of a negative kind. But is there not much sign that that is having any effect in Yugoslavia, is it? Well, we haven't taken that position clearly yet. We have not made a clear precondition. Who has to take that position and where does it come from? Well, the European community has its responsibilities to take there. Mr. Powell. Such a, who is Europe to enforce such a decision? Decisions are enforced by bayonets. And who is to control the bayonets? No, the issue of recognition is not enforced by bayonets. It's enforced by diplomacy. And I'm talking of recognition of new states by the countries of the European community acting in concert as a possible source of pressure in favour of minority rights stability. On peace. the basis of the Council of Europe principles? Yes. Right. Well, the, the point I was trying to make initially is that the Croatian, uh, Republic of Croatia really tried to establish exactly those principles, democratic principles that we are all talking about and all agree upon. The problem is that you have suddenly to face an aggression on your territory which is brought about by really a malignant form of nationalism which tries to expand just the way Hitler tried to do uh, in 1939. Of course, uh, the, uh, again, without raising one particular case, the Serbian counterclaims about what the Croatians did to them historically. That historically, the, uh, yes. That's yes, right. So uh, there are always counterclaims oh, from well, one minor or from one national entity or ethnic identity oh, against another. But now we are talking about something that they claim without, there was absolutely no substance, and I say it with, with all responsibility, there was no substance and no particular piece of evidence that could be produced that the government of democratic Croatia did anything to Serbian minority in uh, the beginning before this violence started. That's Peter Ferrer. That is a very important point. You see, what is bad about nationalism is that there are always and almost exclusively references to the past yeah. and not the common endeavor to do something together for the future. What would have been Europe and what would be Europe if the French and the German in 1945, 6, 7 had acted in that way? Just referring always to the past and what they have suffered from each other. The Europe was created because the two came together and created Franco-German friendship for so, the future. Are you saying there has to be some sort of reconciliation model of that kind to apply to Eastern Europe? Right. Galina Starovoitova. Um, I think, uh, by the way, uh, that the situation in Croatia is not uh, only the tragedy of Croatian people. I think it is our mutual disgrace, disgrace of all the civilized world. And I think maybe it is the time now to refuse from the principle non-intervention in, in such situation when the human rights, when the rights of hum, um, ethnic minorities uh, are, are um, damaged, are not uh, protected. And uh, I think maybe um, we need to organize a more large, more influ uh, influential a unit in United Nations for such situations, something no. like um, the units in black, in sorry, in uh, blue beds, and maybe they will have, unfortunately, many job to do. Well, I think they certainly will. But is it the UN or is it the EC, which is the more appropriate institution, Ralph Darendorf? Well, it's got to be done where it can be done effectively. I certainly feel that uh, Madame Starobaitova has used the right word when she just now talked about a civilized way of dealing. I mean, I deeply believe that civilization is about getting away from the bayonet and is getting to a method of running our affairs by which we can live among people who are different with equal rights. I don't even like all this talk about minorities because by putting people in a minority position they are already by definition to some extent at a disadvantage. For me it's a matter of citizenship at a viable level. Now I regard the Council of Europe as an important step in that direction, only a step, because ultimately it depends <coughs> on the recognition of these principles by its member states. But it is an important step, and I would think that it is more practical to start in Europe than to go to the UN right away. Oh. Although I confess that ultimately I too dream of a civilized world rather than just one civilized country or a few civilized countries. Enoch Powell. He wants a world empire, and he wants a world emperor. But and that is incompatible contrary, with self-government. I want the world rule of law and the world civil society. I think that you, you want the world in position of orders. But is it not an acceptance 
of universally agreed principles. Nobody can accept... The universally agreed principles are distilled. They are not themselves a sovereign. But they, they do not themselves command the allegiance so that people will defend them and give their lives for them. Except, except in Western Europe, uh, they, they clearly do command they the are because I, I Gareth Fitzgerald. That, well, that the, the, remains to be seen. The, the, they are, because in the Western Europe, we have a zone of peace in which the use of violence between states is inconceivable and has become so over the decades. And that zone of peace already, I think, has spread to northeastern Europe. I think it's unlikely that you'd get problems in the northeast. There are problems in the southeast, and we have to spread that zone of peace. And I think perhaps if new states, as they emerge, were encouraged to, to not only to introduce laws in regard to minorities, but to invite the European institutions to verify that they're being implemented. And then, if they are verified, then to recognize them. There's a process there mm -hmm. uh, of interaction which could be very constructive. The only problem that I find with uh, a lot of this is that these are what I'd call cold ideas. These are cool ideas. These are wonderfully rational. In uh, Yugoslavia, this rationality is simply not there. And there are a number of other parts of Europe where the rationality appears to be on the verge of, of, of breaking down. So how do we bridge this gap between the, the cold ideas of rationality and the heat, which surely, we're not kidding ourselves, really is in the ethnic nationalist movement in, in Europe? Galina Starobojtova. As I said, uh, I think um, we cannot manage the situation without um, uh, involving the um, blue berets. But from an, on the other hand, I think we need to put the process of self-determination in some kind of legal uh, way. Uh, I can suggest three principles how to realize, to implement the principle of, of self-determination for the nations in the Europe. First of all, we need to take into account the uh, historical principle uh, or the answer to the question to whom this land uh, belonged uh, in the past. I understand all the relativeness of this approach because it depends on the deepness of our historical retrospective. The second one is, but uh, uh, first principle is is very often overestimated in the uh, ethnic consciousness. Uh, that is why we cannot ignore it. The second one is the contemporary ethnic majority on these territories. And the third one, most important, is the willing of all the population, including ethnic, ethnic majority and ethnic minorities on these uh, territories, I mean the results of referendum. If all three principles combine on the same place, we need to recognize the right for self-determination. But of course the problem is what happens when they don't, and it looks as if that is likely to happen more often than not. Arthur Schlesinger. It may be that any Paul is right in the sense that what's happening in Yugoslavia may be so terrifying that it will have the shock effect yes. that will lead to a mood of reconciliation, just as the Second World War had the effect on France and Germany leading to reconciliation. But clearly, we must understand that we're entering a time where, I suppose history's always been the story of the mixing of peoples, but the mixing of peoples is never going to be greater than it is in the, in the, in the years ahead with this improvement modes of transportation and communication. And all societies are going to face this problem of harmony out of diversity. It's the free move movement of peoples on the one hand against the narrow definition of statehood on an ethnic and geographical basis yes. on, on the other. Do you think finally, Jan Czarnogorski, is this, is this matter controllable? Is this issue controllable in Europe? Yes, yes, it is controllable. Uh, first by, by applying this principle and by developing the, the uh, support and uh, uh, if these principles are applied and uh, not support if these principles are not, not applied. So that nations could have the, the, the choice, the perspective and the choice. Either they, they apply principles and then they would have the perspective among other nations or they do not and then, then they won't have the perspective among other nations. Enoch Powell, do you think that anything that has been said this evening offers some kind of way through this uh, situation? I think it illustrates one of the big differences between the United Kingdom and the continent of Europe. That on the continent of Europe they are used to the concept of a general sovereignty as well as the national sovereignty. The notion of imperium on the continent is very important for the Englishman to understand what is going on on the continent. We ourselves rejected 
that imperium. We said we are a different imperium. We have a different source of authority. And that source of authority is in ourselves, in our own people. And looking at what goes on in Europe, one sees the ghosts of the empire, the ghost of a Holy Roman Empire, the ghost of a Roman Empire, mm. the notion of an overriding sovereignty. And a lot of the contributions that have been made have been by people who wanted an overriding sovereignty to enter in and sort the things out and arrange the pieces neatly. Who, who better to end than, than, than a European who is also an Englishman, I Ralph have, Darendorf? I have chosen the United Kingdom as my country because it is a country of civil rights and civil society in which diverse and different people can live together. I've also chosen the United Kingdom because I hope that this country will be involved in establishing the values which some of us have talked about. Gareth Fitzgerald, 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 a very quick final word. Mr. Powell has indicated that the one nationalism which Europe has not been able to accommodate <clears throat> so far is English nationalism. All the other nationalisms look to Europe, but that nationalism there are still problems about. The debate ends as it began with uh, provocation, which only goes to show how difficult <laughs> the issue of ethnicity and national identity is. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much. That's all from this edition of Assignment. Good evening. Next week's assignment reports from Czechoslovakia on the deep divisions over how... The disturbing insight into how the past continues to influence the present.
This summer, as the Ukraine surges towards independence, the people have been reburying the dead of crimes committed over 50 years ago. In the towns and villages of the Western Ukraine, a battle rages for history. Between 1939 and 1953, this ancient homeland of Ukrainians, Poles and Jews was torn apart by war. Today, hatreds of the past are fueling the conflicts of the present, all made worse by years of official communist propaganda. The ghosts of history have never been laid to rest. За два неповних роки було вивезено Сибір, розстріляно, замордовано два з половини мільйони громадян Західної України. А в кінці червня 41-го року розпірячому було закатовано всіх, хто був в тюрмах і кого схватили в ці дні. Страшним диким злочинам бошевисько-ханкалорійським Катам не може бути ні прощення, ні забуття. Хіба після таких страшних злодіянь наш народ не мав права себе захистити? І дуже часто фальшива бошевистська пропаганда лиє крокодилову сльозу за невинними жертвами, але ніколи не згадує про жертви 39-41 років, які загинули від анкаудисько-бошевистських катів. Ще на сьогодні Знаходять десятки могил, в яких замордовані сотні тисячі невинних наших людей. І хіба це не глум над невинними жертвами, коли якогось поліцая шукають за океаном, а карні злочинці, які катували і мордували наш народ, ходять з погонами, орденами і високими персональними пенсіями по нашій землі? For others in the Western Ukraine, June 1991 was not a time to remember Stalinist atrocities. It was the 50th anniversary of the German invasion of the Soviet Union. That, according to the development of the fascist government, a significant part of the Soviet people, especially Ukrainians, was subjected to the destruction of а оставшихся планировалось использовать как даровую рабочую силу. Величие победы и значение судеб народов нашего Отечества и всего мира огромно. Великая Отечественная война, как символ народной трагедии и одновременно беззаветного героизма советских людей, навсегда останется в памяти благодарного человечества. In September 1939, the Red Army, in agreement with Hitler, invaded the western Ukraine and its capital, Lvov. For 20 years, the region had been ruled by the Poles. Many Ukrainians saw the Soviets as liberators. Two years later, the Germans invaded. Many Ukrainians saw them as liberators, especially when the prisons of the Soviet secret police were opened up. The police training academy in Lvov was once one of those prisons. In the panic to escape the invading Germans, the Soviets slaughtered their prisoners. Nationalists claim bodies of the victims remain buried in the grounds. I want to show you this place for the 
Мы я вам сейчас скажу. Трупы выносили и складали тут рядом, один біля другого. Тут целый ряд был, уже от самой стены, аж десь там, аж до того. Один біля другого рядом складали. И люди приходили, люди познавали, свои шукали. Тут, 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 еще есть. Ну, я познал брата только, и это было смассакровано. Полностью так, что не познать было, только по убранию. А там те поляки познают и по чуботях военных тех было. Где приблизно находилась эта могила? Ну, приблизно то... Если взять от той стены до той стены, то десь на середине. Вот так. И десь... Десь вот так вот. Я не, не могу точно сгадать, десь... То бы вышло тут и середина. Десь вот тут бы вышло середина. For 50 years, witnesses have been too frightened to describe what they found in those first days of the German invasion. Only in June did the nationalists force the Soviet authorities into permitting them to search for remains. Так я знаю то, что тут была пересылка. Мордували людей. Ну, перейди, говори. Перейди, говори. Ну, говори, перейди, что ты говоришь. Ну, что ты боишься? Ну, что ты боишься? Мне было 14 лет. Сестра взяла на батуте, на 4, их в другой годині забрали. Как дитина была полтора года у нее, вот. так и забрали с дитиной. Если мама родила, ты так и забрали. Воронок пошел до, до брами, погрузили и сюда забрали. привезли. Рано... Кто их арестовал? Кто их арестовал? Кто их Сына Сапочка мы называли их. И мы пацаны были, то была сына и красна. Сапочки были такие. Сучасного молодь, сучасне суспільство дати людям факти, корені зла комуністичної партії. А чому тут саме копаєте? Тут, тому що були свідки, які бачили замордованих людей, які розкрили ту тюрму, як говориться, комуністичні окупанти тікали звідси і позамордовували в стінах, потім їх тут вивозили і закопували. Є свідки на сьогоднішній день. Так, 
Так, де, де це де криміналіст? Не, не розкривайте, але не виймайте. Что, можно определить, какого возраста человек Подожди, подожди, для... то, что не зараз. Нельзя? По такому отломку это невозможно. Просто можно говорить о том, что это человеческое, и все. Нету полной кости. Можно определять только, когда полная кость. А так мы ничего не скажем. Ну, если здесь одна я значит, здесь должны быть и, и другие. Я бачила подібну картину в Другобичі, то, розумієте, до всякої біди звикаєш. От, ну, до такої біди звикнути не можна. От, то, то страшне. Ну, то видовисько страшне, коли з землі починають виникати... То, думається, якісь страшні катування вони перенесли ці в'язні. Починає виникати взуття. Ну, то е, видовисько жахливе. Е, то собі можна тільки уявляти то все. От, ну, оскільки я працюю в меморіалі, то е, ми... Ті свідчення без кінця, які нам доводиться чути, вони впливають на психіку. О, так що, прошу того, так, серйозно. В першому році, як німці вступили у Львів, тоді пішов такий слух, що в тюрмах дуже помордовані багато людей. Ну, а ми малі, мені було тоді 12 років, і ми за, за людьми прийшли туди, то там застали страшну картину. Там було дуже багато помордованих людей, просто страшно помордованих. Мужчина був розп'ятий на дверах, розрізаний живіт, і в животі була вставлена дитина. Жінка була, лежала, в неї були відрізані груди, відрізані уха, виколоті очі, була спідниця чорна, в такі рожі червоні. І хлопчик років 14-15 пізнав в тій жінці свою маму. І він страшно став плакати, кричати, він не міг слова сказати, він тільки «мамо, мамунцю, за що вони тебе, за що вони тебе, за що вони тебе?» Як він став кричати «мамо, мамунцю», 
я не могла говорити більше. Ми звідом вилетіли, не знали, не знали, куди навіть йти додому. Я після того почала заїкатися. Я три місяці не могла говорити після того. Потім я ледве прийшла до себе. І оце на протязі цих післявоєнних років мені майже кожну ніч сниться той епізод до сих пір. Я не можу збавитися від того сну. Бувають ночі, що два-три рази мені сниться той самий сон. Я дуже мучуся після того. Це чоловік вистрілом ззаду, в потилицю. Оця людина, скоріше всього, знайшли з таким ж з відкритим ротом, мабуть, він помирав вже в ямі, без від нехватки кисню, з розкритим ротом знайшли. Мабуть, він ще жив і там загинув. Там добре скелет цього мужчини вбити він, напевно, прикладом гвинтівки. Тут розколений череп. І ще перед тим, мабуть, йому засунули ззаду в хребетний стовп залізну скобу. Звідки ми знаємо, що засунули? Тому що пошкоджені ребра. Ребра від тупого предмета. Так що, напевно, його перед тим підвішували куди за цю скобу залізну чи щось. І разом з тим розбити череп. Лобна кістка розтрощена з Польове ранення воно чи є? Тільки по вас є. Так, ми були правильно. Це трагедія майже в кожної сім'ї в нас зачепила. Наприклад, в мене дядька розстріляли на колоді в Польщі. Діду також загинув в Карпатах без вісі. І може хтось їх знайде кості і поховає. Так само, як і я. Чи... Це не є пропаганда. Це не є пропаганда. Ні. А вам не вважає. Та не йдете раді Бога, чи я тут що потушили. Ну що ви тут бачите? Сюди. Сюди. Значить, ви знаєте, що пропаганда є пропаганда, є ще пропаганда, значить, є ще чисто чинівські відносини. Ну а що мішає люди, що стоїть? Навіщо тут лічні? От тут люди працюють, навіщо? Не можна то зробити. очима бачать. Що, що бачать? Ото що, що зробили. Що бачать? Вон що бачить. Ну що бачить? Ну, ну, ну хорошо розкопали. Ну. ну і що? Ну все. Скажи, я бачу свої очі. Ну, де розказувати? От череп, я хочу дивитися, що я теж батька шукаю. Буде, я хочу в нову, то я від закопаю. А, то ви теж так? Так. Ну так же саме. Мене батька закопаний теж. Ну так, закопаний залежить яким? Чи він закопаний? Я не знаю, де він закопаний. На фланді погиб. А, вас на фланді? Так. Ну, забордували. Замордували. Давайте так. Тут. Хто тут лишній, посторонній, нема тут що робити. Хто не працює, ні, хто не працює. Чет мирный луга, он сеет смерть над нашим краем. Иди смелее в бой, рази врага. Суровый дает пор фашистским диким стаям. To Red Army veterans, many of them Ukrainians, the dig at the prison is simply an act of provocation. They had fought for the Soviet Union. The nationalists had been their enemy. Другие позволяют себе задавать риторический вопрос. Разве оба народа не страдали от своих лидеров одинаково? Тем самым уравнивая в памяти народной агрессора и фактически его жертву. Находятся и такие, которые, прикрываясь демократическими лозунгами, стремятся сформировать у населения ненависть ко всему социалистическому, развернули кампанию, кампанию по политической реабилитации головорезов из военных формирований АУМ-УПА, мы не должны допустить искажения исторических фактов. Это бы было, я считаю, кощунством по отношению к миллионам людей, погибших в минувшей войне. Всем сердцем буду я, мой друг с тобой, твой путь я разделю, как верная подруга. Иди, люби. 
By the fourth day, 38 skeletons had been uncovered. Activists had also put together a partial list of inmates known to have been in the prison before the war. Ну вот це тут написано Сярий. Це мій дядько. Він і ще один дядько мій і я в один день перебули арештовані 23 вересня 40-го року. Разом сюди привезли нас на цю тюрму. Потім мене засудили, а вони тут залишилися. То один тут загинув, видно, мабуть, так. Я точно не знаю, бо я був заслужений на 10 років і на Калиму поїхав. А це дядько мій, значить, один вдалося йому таким чудом вийти, а другий тут залишився в тій тюрмі. Це він. Тепер тут ще є такий лига. Іван, це був голова читальні в селі Любінь Великий. Прийшли німці до Львова. І тут же зразу приїхав на Замостину шукати свого брата. Вже на метрів 800. Такий був сморід страшний. Їх так рядами складали. Ну, вони до того використовували жидів. Рядами їх складали всі. Як ті брата свого побачити? Ну, лиця настільки були знівечені. Не можна було пізнати поліції. Я думав, хоча б по Лишетарських червиках пізнати його. Та де? Вони були половину босі. В Москві і роздівали їх. Голі, і тому щось добре, якийсь блузку, чи якийсь плащ, чи червиків, що знімали, а за годинниками, то звичайно, вони дуже охотились все. Не міг я побачити свого брата. Я три дні підряд ходив, виносили всі трупи, виносили брата, я не знаю. Може він десь в камері зараз є, може він закопаний там по костях, я його не пізнаю. І так, я не знаю, де те святе місце, де міг клякнути і помолитися за душу свого брата. Не знаю, за мрастину це його могила. Німці моментально зробили гетто, і всіх жидів там далі від Замарстинова, тої вулиці Каліна, і такі, може, метрів 200-300 промежутих димів, там загородили вони тим, е, таким високим парканом, пильнували кругом СССР і Гестаповичі, і жиди всіх згинали, село Ульово згинали туди. І люди розуміли цю політику німців? Люди розуміли. І вони спочатку, як німці, співчували з нами. Вони ще не знали, яку політику німці супроти нас поведуть. Та німці, коли прийшли, вони хотіли тут, загнали людей, євреїв, звісно, і хотіли їх уничтожити. Завезли багато бочок з бензиною, а бочки зірвали. И украинцы праздновали Юдефрай. Но все-таки еще были некоторые, которые еще спрятались, но потом попадали. Ну, кое-кто и остался жив. Так я говорю, что у нас всех со мной 70-20 человек не старушан осталось живых из тех 5 тысяч. Здесь стояли лавки, я сидел с отцом в этом месте, а здесь было, может, сто штук торы. Здесь был Бальдахим, вот, с двух сторон вели лестницы, и, ну, вообще, еще было чудно, штукатурно, краска чудно была. Ну, так, были люди, верили Бога, молились. Що не зробиш? Так. І люди молились, плакали. Ну, що зробити? Що не зробиш? Політика от нашого здесь руху, меморіалу і тронізації, вона більш лояльна. 
быть евреем, я хочу сказать. Так что сейчас, на тот момент, как дальше будет, не знаю, потому что в истории не очень-то зарекомендовали себе хорошо. Но сейчас ничего. У вас такой большой опыт. Вы доверяете обещанию? Нет, не доверяю. The mass grave in Lvov was just one of many exhumed throughout the Western Ukraine in 1991. But nationalist attempts to use these digs to claim the high moral ground of history merely provoked the communists. On the 50th anniversary of the German invasion, the communists continued to accuse the nationalists of collaboration with the Germans. Many had collaborated, but many others had fought both invaders, the Germans and the Soviets. Yet to these Red Army veterans, all nationalists were fascists. <laughs> Расстреляли львовскую и польскую профессуру вот там на Вулецких холмах. Мы знаем, что их с помощью уничтожено 150 тысяч евреев львовщины. Мы это помним. Не замахивайтесь на нашу память, так называемые паны. Мы утром рано на рассвете зашли в село, и там пьяные националисты, уничтожали польское село. Возле крылечка лежала красивая польская женщина, лет 32, и у нее она была вся, она была убита, и до половины раздета, и у нее на груди ползал ребенок 10 месяцев. И мы схватили этого ребенка, закутали в нашу одежду, потом побежали к ним туда в комнату, нашли там какое-то тропье, закрутили этого ребенка в тропье. И в тропье этого ребеночка привезли в эту деревню гуту Пенячкую. И там нашли женщину полячку, которая кормила этого польского ребенка своей грудью, имела своего ребенка. А потом, когда жгли эти самые гуту Пенячкую, сгорел и этот ребенок в гуте Пенячкой. Вот вам судьба. Хватит, увольте меня, пожалуйста, Бога ради. Тяжко мне вам такие вещи рассказывать. Чего думать? Когда человек знает, ему думать не надо. Думать надо для того, чтобы соврать. А думать надо для того, чтобы выкрутиться. Вот пусть те, кто в этом повинен, и думают. Кто те? Ну, вот те, которые жили польские села, которых я свидетель, как это делалось. Пусть они думают над тем, зачем и как они уничтожали и расстреливали евреев. Пусть они думают над тем, Как они потом, после войны, когда сюда пришла советская армия, уничтожали врачей, медицинских работников и так далее, и так далее. Я не хочу их называть украинцами. Я сам украинец и считаю, что народ Украины – это народ добрый, народ 
трудолюбивый. Но ведь мы говорим не о народе. Мы говорим о выродках. О тех, которые убивали незащищенных поляков. Уничтожали незащищенные еврейские семьи. Да богато это помогало немцам? Никто не схваливал это, потому что это не треба было, понимаете? Но люди просто были затуманены. Люди были так застрахані этими зверствами, что делала Червона Армия, тут, что делали НКВДисты, что они готовы были, кто знает, куда идти на службу, кому служить, лишь бы не повторились эти зверства больше. И через то они шли, были немцы, то, может, они и тому и шли, потому что я была еще тогда очень мала, мне было тяжко тогда разобраться, понимаете? Но я знаю, что немцы делали зверства. Немцы стреляли, но мы знали, что это фашисты, мы их боялись. А тут это были наши старшие брати, гуманисты, понимаете? И вот люди доверяли им сначала, а потом, вот сейчас идут раскопки в всех местах, селах Західної України, на Львівщині, на Тернопільщині, в Івано-Франківську. Ну, если здесь вот входное огнестрельное отверстие, вот выходное, выходное еще, вот входное. Два, значит, два выстрела в него было в голову произведено. По-видимому, он от этого и умер, как считать можно. Ну, это на 99 процентов. Ну, и основном... Возраст это... тоже видно, что это молодой был по зубам, он не совсем не стертый. Молодой. Сколько приблизительно? Ну, где-то максимум 25. Максимум. Это максимально. Большинство из них были в темной одежде, напевно, просто знали, куда они идут, что в тюрьму, и, и вдягались скромнейшие и в темнейшей одежде. Это, мабуть, что-то типа поджарчика. Ну тут прошу подивитися. Годзик сберегся. Годзик сберегся, добре, бачите. Это, напевно, с пиджака Годзик. А вот моя дикая специфика рабочая. Потому что я хотел Украину. Я добывал Украину, молодой. Мне было 19 лет. И как вы ее добывали? Что вы делали? Здесь броей в руках, под бродами. Вы были в Усе с Галичине? Так. Где вы были? Под бродами, по Чапе, под Золочевым. Под Тернополем, но все не запоминаешь. Я был в 29-м регименте, третья компания, первый год, и я уже был руевым. Мне было 19 лет. Ну, 25-го года. Рахуйте. Почему вы пошли до этого заключения? Потому что той тоталитарной системы уже мой организм сразу не мог принять. Когда я только почув вывеску, что организуется дивизия Галичина, я тоже сразу пришел в Добровольцы в Запсовщик эту дивизию. Как полная назва этой дивизии? Полная назва. Трошки нас дразнит, наш, наш народ, наш народ с этим примирился, но москалю не дай бог. СС дивизия Галичина. Добровольная СССР дивизия Галичина. Но мы СС не вживали, то был осередок первой украинской армии. Мы хотели иметь свою армию, чтобы... Відстоїти своїми грудьми свій навіть і свою землю перед більшовиками. І я думаю, що я, тому що мама мене коли проводила до війська, і сказала сину відомсти смерть свого брата. А ім'ям його брата було Ярослав. І я думаю, що я відомстив. To the embarrassment of many Ukrainians, a monument was erected this summer to the Ukrainian SS division Galicia. Within three weeks, the monument had been blown up. No, такие зверства могли сделать только кигибисты. Больше никто. Уже после того, как тот памятник строился, в газете 
в Бринській газеті, обороту теж недалеко. Партократи вже два рази писали газеті, виступати проти того пам'ятка, казали, що тут бандьори будують, що ми, дивізійники, були запроданці, що ми разом з німцями хотіли будувати, будувати, будувати нову Європу, що ми разом з ними, що ми як фашисти, тільки самі як німці. То все неправда. Ми хотіли мати свою національну армію. І ми тут боронили свою землю для того, щоб більшовики не прийшли до Львова. Ми свою землю боронили, своїх же людей. Ми знаємо, що вони зробили 39 40 41 роках. Моєго рідного брата замордували. Стільки людей не виник депортували. А тут вони тільки чекали, щоб ми той пам'ятник збудували. Ну, кара Божа їх настигне. Є кара Божа не у мене. Так легко їх то не обійдеться. Ми боротись, українська молодь, поки ворог не скапітулює перед нашими ідеями і цілями. Та, на жаль, і багато зараз наших політиків каже, що наше нам згадувати про ОУН, наше нам згадувати про пам'ять героїв. Зараз настали інші часи, але я кажу вам, що не було б нашої спілки, не гуртувалась би молодь. Як би не було традицій української боротьби. The struggle between the communists and the nationalists did not end with the return of the Red Army in 1944. In the face of overwhelming odds, partisans continued a guerrilla war until 1953. Thousands died. Thousands more ended up in the camps of the Gulag as the Red Army and the secret police reimposed the old Stalinist order. Бачила, я, наприклад, була в одному із сіл Яворівщини, і там прийшли хлопці в село для того, щоб поїсти, для того, щоб може і помитися, бо жили ж вони в лісах, жили на своїй землі, як на чужій. Хто? Бандерівці. Це була армія УПА, і тут НКВДсти зробили облаву. І страшна стрілянина почалася. Стали до того стріляти, стали горіти хати. Дівчинка трьохрічна втікала, бідна. Так цей НКВДист схватив її і кинув її живу вогонь. І стріляли, і не перебираючи, стареньких бабусь, дідів, маленьких дітей. Хто йшов напроти них, хто їм попав під руки, вони всіх стріляли і кидали вогонь в цей. Бо горіли повністю хати, села, ревіла худоба, корови, коні, вили собаки. Це було... 